Check this out. I grew mushroom on garbage. Hi everyone. Welcome to Workday Gourmet. Today we're talking about electric kitchen composter, the niche gadget that's beloved to many and useless to others. It's been on my watch list forever. Obviously, when I was offered a free one to try out, I was like, "Yes, please." This is the newbie's introduction to what electric composters do, what they're not, and ways that I like to use them. Starting with some reality check that really bummed me out at first. You don't get magic potting soil in a day. For the most part, the output cannot be used immediately. There are exceptions that I will show you in a bit. But generally speaking, what you get from the machine is simply ground up dehydrated food bits. The drying drastically reduces the volume and increases the surface area, which makes composting more time and space efficient. But the electric gadget will not decompose bio waste in two hours. You'll need microbes, earthworms, and time for that. What the machine does offer is an easy, scalable, not gross way to compost. For half-ass hippies like me who aspire to help with the environment but realistically couldn't commit to keeping a hot pile of garbage in the backyard year-round, as much as I'm passionately anti-HOA, even I think composting large amount of rotten food with neighbors nearby can be genuinely uncool, at least for beginners that cannot effectively contain the impact, like odor or pest. The realistic space requirement for composting is not just the size of the outdoor bins, but the smell radius of what's left out, which is where this gadget comes in helpful. With dehydrated kitchen scrap, the smell radius is maybe arm's length tops. A full bucket of scraps yields such a small handful that you can continuously toss outdoors or keep indoors until you have a large batch to handle altogether. They're dried, smell-free, and basically shelf-stable. You can leave large batches indoors until next spring, and it's not gonna go bad or anything. When you are ready to use them, the pre-composting will really help speed up the process. I waited until my potato harvest to use mine. Potatoes and starchy root vegetables in general are so good at pulling nutrients out of the soil and into the tubers, they tend to leave the soil depleted after the season. The spent soil could really benefit from some organic boost, especially if you plan on using it again next year. Just bury the precompost in between two layers of old soil, sprinkle some water to promote bacteria growth, and leave it out for earthworms to chew it up. Think of this as a blend between trench method and vermicompost. Trench composting is the oldest trick out there, which involves simply digging a hole and bury the stuff. And vermicompost means let worms eat it up and do the work for you. You might wonder, what about the greens and browns, the nitrogen to carbon ratio? See, that is a method to optimize the environment for microbes to speed up the decomposition. You need a process to be efficient if you're keeping large piles of hot garbage in the backyard. But that's less of a pressing need if you're just dealing with a small handful at a time. In my opinion, a big benefit of this gadget is that. It allows you to skip the scale and the math. All food will decompose over time. If you must worry about the microbes, you can always add some back in in the form of any home fermentation liquid, from preserved lemons, pickles, or sauerkraut. Don't worry about salting the soil. That little bit of salt will be so diluted by liters of additional water and soil, it is very easy to stay under healthy soil salinity. If you don't do home fermentation, there's always old kombucha or kefir, or simply get a compost starter, which you absolutely do not need, but is again an easy, non-gross way to add microbes to kickstart the process. Now let's talk about how you can use the output directly without the six to eight week composting time. See, the reason you generally can't put this stuff on plants right away is that the scrap tend to be very nutrition dense in a way that plants can't use, but other things can. Rehydrating them on potted plants will make the whole thing susceptible to mold and bugs, which is detrimental to the health of your plant. In the short run, without decomposing first, garbage in, garbage out still holds true. Now, knowing the source of the problem, if you are willing to be mindful of what goes in, stick with relatively clean, not moldy, low-sugar kitchen waste like eggshells and banana peels. You can directly use them as fertilizers without harming your plants. I'm putting them on my taro and dill plant. Weeks later, no yellowing or wilting to my taro leaves. 
check out how much my deal has grown since adding the fertilizers. The manufacturer generously sent me a spare bucket, which is great for alternating in a large household. I keep one clean bucket exclusively for dehydrating citrus peels and leaves for tea. Dried orange peels is a great addition to any braise, and just about any citrus peels will work really well in an herbal tea blend. I planted a lemon tree from the seed of a supermarket lemon 10 years ago. It had luscious leaves year after year, but has given me no fruit to date. After lamenting for years that I got a lemon, I decided to make some use out of all the leaves, and discovered to my pleasant surprise they make amazing tea. They taste like lemon drop candy, fragrant like the fruit, mildly sweet, with very little acidity. I should have harvested my lemon leaves from the very first year. Lastly, in the spirit of repurposing and with the mindset that plants can't use the pre-compost right away but other organisms can, I thought why not try the pre-compost with the fungus of my choice. I'm using the pre-compost directly to grow pink oyster mushrooms, which are very hard to find in store because they rot quickly after harvesting. You'd have to pay through the nose at some fancy snooty restaurant for them. A hardcore mycologist would have grown from spores, and a casual hobbyist would at least clone on agar, or colonize their own grains with liquid culture, both of which would be more economical if you're growing large quantities. But for first-time newbies, I strongly recommend buying grains bound directly to minimize risk of contamination. Success rate is far more important than bragging rights. I managed to find quite a handful of academic research on using agricultural waste for mushroom cultivation, and adopted methodologies from two papers to try here. The first study came from North Carolina State University on using corn husk compost. The pre-drying allows us to effectively control the hydration percent and to sterilize whatever ecosystem that's thriving on the corn husk. No water, no life, for the most part. There are spores that can survive dry environment, which is why the study also called for pressure sanitizing the rehydrated substrate for 15 minutes, just to be safe. After cooling, we can colonize the grow bag with grain spawn. The paper called for 10 grams grain spawn per kilo bag, which is actually really low. I think the 10 to 1 ratio is a lot more commonly seen than 100 to 1. But the paper does purport that corn husk increased the mushroom yield, so maybe that's why they went really low. You'll need to let mycelium colonize the bag before starting to fruit it. Keep it in a dark and relatively humid environment for colonization. Within a week, you should see white fuzz beginning to branch out. That's the mycelium. The mushroom we eat is just the fruiting part of the larger organism, kind of like plants in a way like the tree and roots are a lot bigger than the fruit. Once the whole bag is taken over by mycelium and begin to show pinning, you can cut the bag to allow the fruit to grow through. The second batch was inspired by this Reddit post of mushrooms growing on pineapple, and this paper from the NIH archive on pineapple compost. Their methodology called for mixing pineapple compost with sawdust. I'm using grill pellet, which is like 50 cents a pound. For my fellow aspirational pitmasters out there, here's your chance to use up that 20 pound bag you got early summer two years ago. These pellets were supposedly sanitized already when they were compressed, so a lot of people use them with oyster mushrooms directly, without additional pressure cooking, which is exactly what I did here, just to see if I could cut some corners. And I think that's almost certainly what led to this weird fruiting before full colonization on my pineapple bag. Supposedly, the mushroom rushes to release spores to outcompete the contamination. So definitely pressure sanitize your bag if using pre-compost. My corn bag behaved largely as expected, despite me not strictly following the lighting, temperature, or humidity requirements. My basement temperature is between 22 to 23 Celsius or 72 Fahrenheit and humidity hovered between 75 to 99 percent. My basement does have a window, but not a whole lot of light, so it gets a little light for about half a day. Some of the early fruiting got stalled, 
probably thinks to me keep sticking my camera in a grow box to take pictures and videos. But new pinning keeps coming out, so hope is not lost. I will update with a YouTube short if these ever get really big and stay this vibrant in color. If you find my video informative, please give me a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't. The air thrill composter and mushroom spawns used in the video are linked in the description if you're interested. Thanks for watching. Have fun in the kitchen.